Coach Cooper was on a roll. I believe well, no, it. I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just ask you a question uh, again. Um, it was most of my fights before I started fighting amateur and, and then eventually turning professional and winning championships and all of that. Before I even started Muay Thai, um, my fights were mainly in defense. Uh, I was never a troublemaker, but I loved trouble. So <laughs> uh, I, I kind of... I kind of wanted people to mess with me. Uh, you know, I just wanted to fight anyway. So any little thing, I would just start punching people or attacking people. This, this is before after you started that, taking, taking classes. You, say again? This is before or after you started taking classes. Oh, no, no, no. This, this is before, way before. I'm talking, dude, I was fighting at a young age, six, seven, eight years old. Remember, man, I'm the youngest of eight kids. So I was fighting my whole life. You know, fight my sisters, fight my cousins, fight people in the neighborhood. Remember, you, you, you're you talking about the early 80s, 81, mm -hmm. 82, 83. The whole culture was different. Fighting wasn't frowned right. upon. If you had a disagreement, you fucking fist fight. That's simple. Right. You know, it wasn't like it was a bad thing. No one pulled out weapons. It was, hey, look, what's up? You start swinging toe to toe. Back then, if you were fighting and you guys went to the ground, grown people would pick you up and make you stand up and fight again. So there was honor in street fighting. It wasn't like people were jumping you or you were getting stabbed or people were pulling out guns. So, so like I said, most of my fights, I, I never caused trouble, but I wanted trouble to come to me. I wanted someone to talk about me or bump me or step on my shoe or say something about my mama back then was a bad you. thing. Mm -hmm. people, right. would say, people would say stuff about your mama. Oh, your mama this, and you fight them for it. You know, I, I wanted those I wanted those problems. So you had natural aggression and you naturally Very. had a tendency. Uh, you, you liked conflict. What At what yes. point did you decide that you wanted to be a professional fighter and enter that domain? Uh, it was a long time, man. It was way, I had probably been fighting amateur for who knows, five, six years. When I had, did you start amateur? Say again? When, when did you start amateur? Jesus Christ, I had my first amateur smoker when I was 10 years old. Huh. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah. They they used to have a we used to have at least a show every month, sometimes twice a month. They'd have smokers. You just come there with your shin pads and gloves and they wait that you know, they weigh people, line you up and you fought. You know, what, like, like an aggressive sparring session. Yeah, yeah. I mean you had shin pads and boxing gloves, um, and it were one minute rounds, mm. uh three one minute rounds, and you just fight. People would come out and it was awesome. Um, for a long time, I did that for three or four years, or may maybe even five years. I didn't want to become a pro fighter until probably <sighs> I say I, I I thought about it at like sixteen stuff like that. I was already winning national championships all over the country at that age on, on the amateur level. But remember, I was doing a lot of things. Uh, I was a football star and track star played basketball i was all around athlete so i wanted to be in the nfl more than anything fighting was just something was like a, it was an adrenaline rush you know it was cool to do on the weekends and it was something i always did um so it, it was really nothing it was just something i did um my real dream was uh, football was like my favorite thing to do. That's why I made good grades in school and stuff like that, just so I could be on the football team. Uh, fighting was 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 much late, later after that. I was always fighting before I ever played football. But I love football more than all of this stuff. Uh, but at the t as a Hall of Famer, as a coach, and as a fighter, something must have clicked. Uh, at a point to say that you're going to dedicate your livelihood to this pursuit of being the best uh, martial artist in the world. W when did that happen or did it happen in that way? Um, 
everything I do, I always try to be the best, whether it was football, whether it was, it was in the classroom. Like, I made all good grades in school, always made A's, no less than B's. Anything I do, I've always visioned myself as being the best. Uh, so it's just something that, 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 that I think I was, I was blessed with from my parents. Uh, they worked very hard. Uh, I don't know, but anything I did, even when I was fighting on the amateurs, when I was in high school, I was still about being the best. Um, there's nothing I've never done where I didn't want to be the best in it. I'm just, it's just not in my, in, in my DNA to just do something. Uh, one quick second. This is crazy. One quick second. All right, now we're back. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've always just – anything I do, I don't even – really see a lot of people process things and think about things i just make things natural for me like anything i do i just say hey i'm gonna be the best and and i do my best to be the best in it anything my coaching when i fought everything i do when i'm with my daughter i want to be the best dad in the world um, that's anything I do. When I'm with my girlfriend, I want to be the best boyfriend in the world. There is nothing that I do that I don't want to be the best in. It's just part of my DNA. So I never really thought about fighting like that. My goal was to be an NFL football player. Uh, it didn't happen. And after that, my only refuge was my martial arts. And it was probably a blessing for me because, you know, the – Everything about me was martial arts, and I just wasn't acknowledging my true talent. I, I had a, this fantasy of doing something else, and the whole time the universe and God saying, you need to be doing this, and I'm ignoring it and trying to do something else. And that's why it didn't work out for me, because it wasn't meant for it, for it to work out for me. So after my college football career and all of that, I had already won national championships on the kickboxing level, on the amateur level. Uh, and then I started competing on the world amateur level. And after that, it was the, the, the next best thing. Um, after winning world amateur, two world amateur titles, it was just about going, going pro and, and the rest is history turned pro and fought a lot, won a lot, won championships, got inducted into the hall of fame, the masters of Marsh Shores hall of fame in 2008 had a long professional boxing career also. You had four mixed martial arts fights. Uh, was the second American to get uh, uh, selected in the, in the great K-1. Uh, used to be the biggest kickboxing show on the planet. It was big before the UFC just yeah. got Gatchewam, took over the world. That's right. Uh, uh, you know, and, and... What did you get paid for your first fight, Coach? Shit. What was your, my, your first K1 my, fight? Well, no, no. My first kickboxing fight was nothing. Maybe like four or five hundred bucks. My first professional kickboxing fight. But K1 was different, man. They 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 were paying real money. That's what was so tantalizing about K1. We we're making thousands in K1. No one made less than eight, nine thousand uh fighting K1. Uh I made a lot more because I had a contract with K1, but uh, my first kickboxing fight, it was uh, no more than 500 bucks. I think it was like 400 bucks, something like that. Uh, well, so you know, so back, then, the back then, back yeah. then we weren't doing kickboxing for the money. It was just about, it was about the pride, not the prize. You know, needless to say, um, the, the sport of a Muay Thai and and even any style of kickboxing is so brutal. Guys need to be paid more. And I, I really feel like uh, us kickboxers got taken advantage of completely. Uh, it's a brutal sport, a lot of damage to the body, and there was yeah. no real reward except for the K1. Well, you you know, you, it's unfortunate because as we talk about this, I think last week, Glory kickboxing folded. Uh, yes. And and that was a I I very much enjoyed that league. And yeah, well, remember all all glory was was a derivative of the K one. Right. You remember when glory first started? It was Team Glory, one of the most incredible Dutch kickboxing teams. Right. Uh, in K one, just started their own company when Master Ishi 
had the tax trouble and they eventually lost the Fuji TV sponsorships and all of that. And the K1 basically folded. That's when Team Glory, guys, the Glory team started their own company. So, so when you look at when you so look so, at so so all this is K1 is just that's that's all it was. It was the new school K1. Right, right. When you look at the new school K1 and the glory that folds, and you hear a comment from Dana White that says that you know the UFC is not a career; it's an opportunity. As a Hall of Famer yourself, and as a coach. And you see guys in Vegas all the time coming to be the champion and to make a name for themselves, but also hopefully to make money for them and their families. Where do you see the state of, uh, of, of, of MMA or kickboxing or combat sports today? Is it a career for these folks or is it still uh, just a pathway to um, action, satisfying a credit? Well, well, you know, sadly to say, and people are going to think I'm, I'm crazy for this, but Dana is absolutely correct. Um, if you're not very talented, it's definitely not a career, let's be honest. Um, careers mean something that you can sustain doing a long time. So the UFC, maybe not maybe not be something you can sustain for a long time. However, a mixed martial arts career is something you can sustain for a long time. So Dana's right. First of all, there's a big misconception out there. Everyone acts like MMA is UFC. It isn't. Yes. Mixed martial arts is the sport. UFC is a is a very popular company that endorses and that presents the sport of mixed martial arts. People all the time tell me, hey, uh, do you do UFC? No, UFC is a company that, that does mixed martial arts. Right. So in saying that, Dana is 100% correct. Not everyone is going to be able to sustain a, a 10, 15, 18-year career in the UFC. A right. few guys have. Um, you know, guys like Cowboy Cerrone been fighting it a long time, etc. But it's not a career in the UFC unless you're very talented, guys. But you could go to Bellator. You could go fight in other smaller companies. You could go to Japan and fight mixed martial arts. I know guys have been doing mixed martial arts since since basically, what, the early 2000s, late 90s, and they're still fighting. So... A mixed martial arts is something you could have a career in. The UFC is for the chosen, select, excellent fighters that can sustain that level of competition and that level of excellence for a long period of time. Well, so how you, do, I'm sorry, well, Scott, well, so even, even then, um, I mean, he might be right for another reason also. And so UFC, not a career in the sense that, like you're saying, MMA is a sport. So I can have a career in baseball. Whether or not it includes the MLB or some Canadian League or whatever it is is a different thing. And so Minor league, goal, yeah, for sure. Is, is I think um, career kind of comes with baggage, right? And what Dane's saying is that look, it's it's an opportunity. You know, a career you expect dental, you expect benefits, you expect you know all these things. You expect you know a package at the end. You expect uh, the longevity. No, no, yeah, no, no not really guaranteed. Oh, you know, it, it, or any yeah, yeah. Like a even career if you're super talented. You know, you're yeah, no, no. three years after, you know, uh, a really bad fight or something. Yeah, but but I mean, if you're really talented, your career is going to last for longer than three years because you're going to do the right things. You're going to be strong. You're going right. to you're going to heal. You're going to take care of your body. If you're talented, you're going to last longer than three years. We can't name one talented fighter that only lasted for three right. years. That ain't never going to happen because talent is more than just being able to fight. Talent is being mentally strong, having a strong body, strong right. mind, strong heart, make the right decisions, take care of yourself. John Jones, for instance, has had longer than a three-year career. How many drug incidents he's had in all these off-field situations or off-fight situations, right. but he's still the best fighter in mixed martial arts. Right. He's talented. You know what I mean? So if you're talented, you're definitely going to last longer than three years unless you get paralyzed or killed. That's simple as that. And remember, career doesn't mean dental and insurance. A career simply means sustaining a professional job, 
for a long period of time. And you can do that with the sport of mixed martial arts. You may not be able to do that in the UFC per se. That's why Dana is 100% right in, and, and, in what he said. Um, you have, remember, UFC started this mixed martial arts thing. That's why people look at it like it is the mis, mixed martial arts thing. Um, so, you know, Dana's right. Not everyone's going to make it to the UFC. Not everyone's going to sustain themselves in the UFC. And not everyone's going to make millions in the UFC. Correct. That takes talent. That takes a lot of a lot of variables and layers that we could talk about all night. So, so let, let's let's move to a subject then that kind of uh, puts uh, into perspective what it takes to make it in the UFC or at an optimal level. This program, The Edge, focuses on extraordinary people. We call them warriors yes. and folks that do or that are able to do extraordinary things. You are not only an extraordinary person and an extraordinary fa father I've seen from your Instagram and you raise an extraordinary daughter, but you are working with extraordinary fighters um, at all levels. Guys like Tim uh, Chwamba, who I, I came to your gym, I was impressed with all the way to guys like Kevin Lee and Francis uh, who are uh, on the top of the world. Uh, so my question is, what really, Coach, tell us, what separates um, the, the guys who can, like you just said, three years, an exceptionally talented person or longer, what, 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 what makes them tick? And what are they doing that gives them that optimal level to continue mentally, physically, on all levels? Well... There's definitely not one definite answer, but a few things. First of all, I'm all about God-given attributes. Um, so in other words, genetics, number one. Number two, mental fortitude. Because without a strong mind, nothing works. So even though I say I said I said genetics number one, the strong mind is absolutely the most vital asset. After that, lifestyle. The way you grew up, did you struggle? Did you have hardships? Uh, did you have to fight for things? Did you develop an, a, an inner animal within you that, if need be, you will release it, uh, uh, unrelentingly release it, and, and let it do what it does? After that comes being smart, having a good team around you, and the last thing, and this is the thing that that now is is very important in today's landscape. Being a polarizing figure, being intriguing, um, having that it factor. And that's just not about your fighting. In the social media climate, you have to be able to uh, appeal to people, make people excited, um, that sort of thing. So it's so many variables, man. Um, more so in this time than anything, your appeal, your popularity, the way you intrigue people is very, very important. Of course, in the Ali era, it was important. In the Mayweather Jr. era, it was important. But it's even more so important now with the uh, uh, invention of social media and the way you can really market yourself more so than, than the news or the media markets you. Um, and I agree with you, Coach, because I think that, that that gives a different element. On the question of optimization, I think you gave a lot of answers. Uh, but to tie it together on optimization of both physical and career, I think you need that, that, that platform that the UFC, for example, you were mentioning uh, as an opportunity to get more famous. And if you can establish a brand on social media, you might be able to give yourself more than just – uh, a fighting career, but you can also get into to business. Do you, Absolutely. Do you see Absolutely. that as a possibility for a lot of these fighters? And how would you recommend these fighters that are listening to this program? Or, and what are you telling fighters on a daily basis and how they can optimize their business performance? Well, well, I mean, I'm like a caveman when it comes to that sort of thing because <laughs> I don't even optimize my, my social business. You know what I mean? But 
I'm old school when it comes to that sort of thing. I believe your talent, your fighting ability, I believe letting that speak for itself mainly. Then the shenanigans of being intriguing to people. In other words, some guys get a lot of popularity off just straight talking trash and all of that. Great if your ass can fight too. You can't talk all that stuff and then, you know, get outclassed. You know what I mean? So I believe first I would tell, well, I tell my young guys like Timmy, man, be the product first. Be able to fight. Be able to do all that stuff first. After that, we'll work on the other things. Yes. You know, being intriguing to people. Uh, he's already a pretty boy. Just smile on your pictures and all of that type of stuff. <laughs> uh, my main ingredient to me is to be real about whatever whatever profession you're doing, whether you're an author, a fighter, a doctor, be real about it. So make sure you have the talent in that field that you're pursuing as a profession first. Second comes the swagger and the intrigue and the charisma and all these other elements that's, that's luck or just the it factor. Who would have thought Conor McGregor was going to get so popular? Right. You know what I mean? He could fight, but goddamn, he's beyond his popularity is beyond his fighting but yeah. that's rare who would have thought Ronda Rousey was going to get so popular when Dana didn't even want girls in the UFC right, right. it's hard to to, to ha put a finger on that it factor um it's right. just hard to do Masvidal now been fighting for what 15 16 years didn't get popular till two years ago he put 13 years in before people really even knew him like that. Right, right. I mean, so, but then you got guys like Kevin Lee, who are all who from the beginning are the it factor. From the time yes, they yes. see you, I see. I, I know, but but that's something we can't pinpoint. It's right. just Kevin. You know, right. he's a collegiate guy. He's a good looking guy. He has right. he has right. good conversation, and people like him. Intelligent. Kevin right. is a really cool guy. People right. think he's. Whatever they think he is, he's a really great guy. Right. You know, sweetheart of a guy. He, you know, he cares about people. He gives to people. He helps people. So his true self probably isn't the picture that you paint of him as his image in the UFC. But people still like him either way. So that it factor is so hard to define. It's just certain people got it. I mean, you know, yeah. Mike Tyson, look at him. Youngest heavyweight champion. Um, his last few fights didn't go so well, but right now he's the hottest guy on the internet about fighting again. <laughs> People forgot about his last few fights. Not dissing Mike at all. Uh, just turned 54. Looks tremendous in the gym. But people people forgot about, you know, his last few fights and how they went. And, uh, you know... He has that it factor. What he says, what he does, people just love it, no matter what the outcome of of his situations be. So it's just it's just too hard to explain. I tell my guys, just train hard, fight hard, and the world will decide where you be. But if you keep it real with your profession, keep it real with your training and, and, and having the right team, the right people around you, no matter what people say, You'll get your just due by the end. You know what I mean? Mother Dog is a perfect example of that. Been fighting all these years. He kept training, kept fighting, losing fights, winning fights, kept being the person he is, and now look at him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, a guy like a, a, a guy like Kamaru Usman, very yeah. close to Francis Ngannou. I've held pass for Kamaru uh, several times. He's a good guy, you know. We consider each other friends. I've hung out with him on some nightlife stuff in, in, in different cities. Great guy. I remember Dana saying he was a boring fighter and all of this, <laughs> what, two two years ago. And now, you know, he's one of the kings of, of the UFC. Absolutely so, he is. You know, charisma is you. It's a little bit of the political machine pushing you. It's a little bit of the marketing. It's so many different layers. Um, all I can tell well, guys, 
train hard, do the best you can do, and and you'll level yourself to where where you deserve to be and where you need to be at some point. Well, but you also um, put in the work. I remember when Scott and I were visiting you uh, at your gym uh, about nine months ago. You were about to embark on a birthday, twenty-four hour workout, um, and yes. you have a, an anniversary every year where you, on your birthday, uh, do a twenty-four hour workout. And to me, I know other professional athletes, uh, professional fighters who do similar things on their birthday. I had never heard about a twenty-four hour cycle, but that's what to me when I heard that. I knew that you put in the work from being at the gym with you, and I knew that you already had this mentality of, and I want to explore that, and maybe Scott will get into that in a second, of you should fight anywhere, anytime. When we were at the gym, you were saying, if you're a fighter, you take a fight. You don't dodge fights if you're a fighter. And so when I, when I, when I heard what you said, and I, I saw you going for 24-7 training, it, it appeared to me that you put in the work. So, you know, re- are you still with me, Coach? Coach? I think Coach is... I mean, I think it's been... We're going to have to cut this. Hello? Can... Again? Yeah, I'm here. I can okay. hear that. I can hear you. I'm here. Sorry, yeah, Coach. We got dis- okay, we got disconnected, but my question was, I think nope. you heard me... 24, when I was there at your uh, gym, you were uh, embarking on a 24-hour yeah. workout, and you had the mentality that you should fight anyone. If you're a fighter, you fight. You know, this work ethic and this mentality that you have, tell us a little bit more about that, and and, and, and is this the key to your success that you just outwork everyone that you're, you're with? Um, well, for me, it was the key to my success, um, but everyone's different. Um, some guys, you know, we're, we're all different. We all have different elements that are, are essential to our success. Um, for me, I was never given anything easy as a kid. I'm the youngest of eight, man. I had to fight. You know, I was fighting my sisters and shit just for now laters and Twix candy bars and shit when I was a kid, you know, uh, and, and, and that was just my mentality. I was the smallest guy in my family. My brothers ran a faster 40 yard dash than me. They had a stronger bench press than me, my older brothers. So my whole life, I always knew I had to work harder. I just got to work harder. I got to be smarter. I got to work harder. And that's just something I carry with me from a, a young age. Um, and it just worked for me. Yeah. One thing we can all agree on, hard work and being dedicated definitely can't fail you. It may not catapult you to the level you want to get to, but it'll definitely assist you in getting there. It's never a detriment. I don't know, I, I don't know many lazy people that are very successful. They got success. They were successful first. Then they got lazy. You know what I mean? Uh, So it just always worked for me being willing to work hard as hell, outwork my people, and not just that physical element of being in shape. Mentally, when you really push yourself and really make yourself feel like you have no limits, you can do amazing things. You can be injured and keep doing it. You can be hurt and keep fighting. You can be a 25 to 1 underdog and not go into a fight nervous because you know you've done the work. You know that no one can write your history but you. And man, so many guys fake this confidence thing now. So many guys talk big talk and get in there scared. So many people say, oh, we're all scared. No, we're not. I think a lot of people mistake a new element or new chemicals in their body that's going through their body as fear. That's endorphins. That's adrenaline. That's excitement. That's what I always called it. I was never scared. I fought Peter Hartz. I fought Gary Gerridge. I fought Corner Williams. I fought Duke Rufus. Man, I fought John Claude Lahir. I fought Rick Rufus. I was never scared. 
win, lose, or draw. I didn't go into any fight scared. I said to myself, I'm excited. I'm ready to get busy. And that was it. Wait, and, wait. and so many fighters now going there, oh, I feel fear, but I'm going to go anyway. No. If you're scared, why the fuck are you doing it? That was my mentality. Right. If I'm scared, why am I going to do this shit? And, and, and so many people nowadays talk about the fear and they're scared, but they're still doing it. I, I just don't tick that way. I'm not scared of anything, man. I'm scared of being broke. I'm scared of being homeless. That's it. You know what I mean? And I, I I really mean that. So my mentality, due to the way I was brought up, due to my men mentality of hard work and outworking everyone, no limits, no matter how tired you are, you work, you work, you work. That is what gave me the confidence of not having fear, not being scared. Mike Tyson made, because the model told Mike Tyson that famous line that everyone uses, everyone has a plan to their punch in the face. No. Every fighter has a plan and should expect to get punched in the face. Right. If, right. if being punched in the face changes your plans, you're not a real fighter because you're going to get punched in the fucking face. So yeah. if I if I got punched in the face, my plan didn't change. I just try to do it faster and more. I really push that plan more. And my coaches will tell you that. Um, and, 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 and I really try to tell my fighters that don't fall – into these mentalities of fear and scared and stress. No, we are excited. No, we are not stressed because we prepare for this moment through our hard work and our fucking dedication. Why did we spar twice a week, get shark drills, shark drilled with six different guys getting on your ass for one minute each per round to go in there against one guy and have fear? to go in there against one guy and be scared. These are all mental blocks that we put on ourselves. These are all weakness and our mentalities that we cast upon ourselves that we don't have to have. Being confident in yourself, not being afraid of yourself, and not being scared at that moment does not guarantee you a victory. But it's definitely not going to uh, uh, push you further from victory. Right. Having confidence and believing in what you do will catapult you to greater things than not. And that's one thing for sure. And and, and that's really, really serious to what, what, what I tell my fighters every day. Every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm preaching to them these notions because I don't like those type of mentalities. Everyone's scared. Everyone's stressed. Everyone feels fear. No. You chose to be a fighter. We didn't get drafted. We didn't get Heisman trophies and shit. We decide to be a fighter. Right. Therefore, fight time. Let's be excited. Let's be confident. And let's just fight. Win or lose, we walk out of that motherfucker with pride because we know we did the very best we can do. And with that mentality, we're going to win more than we lose because we're not going to fold under the pressure of the bright lights. We're not going to fold because this dude is buff because he hit us hard one time or kicked us in the leg hard one time. Only way we don't win is if that guy is a bad man. And, and he was a better man than us. It won't be because of all these exterior notions or exterior elements that made us lose. And these are the things that a lot of people don't understand. If we get beat, let it be a better man, not the fucking moment. That's the clarity that as a that that's that's why you're a Hall of Famer, first of all. And second of all, that's what in any discipline you have to understand to be successful as an entrepreneur coach because I'm a martial artist but I'm not a fighter yes. and I've never been in there so I don't understand that but I know as an entrepreneur that if you're not prepared to get smacked every day then you're not going to be a successful entrepreneur just like you said you're going to get hit so what now move forward and you're going to get hit again and you're going to get hit again and you're going to get hit again and you better expect that. Otherwise, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. And so yes. when you say that, it makes sense. But so many people are afraid. And, you know, you can take it in a different direction. 
fear is what causes a lot of racism. Fear is yes. a lot uh, causes a lot of fights. Yes. Fear is what causes a lot of problems. When people don't have confidence, not only are they not successful, but they also become problematic. Yes. And they they look at, let's say, a black man and say, hmm, I'm afraid of him because they're not confident, confident in their own ability. We're going yes. through some of that as a nation. Yes. We're going through that in every day of our life, and there's no fans there to say it. And as a fighter, and I think in the fight game, you have fans up until a couple months ago. Uh, you know, uh, There's fans there, and you live in existence where people watch you. They see yes. you take pain. They see you having the, the people that go through the pain, like Dustin Poirier. He comes yes. back last yes. weekend, and, and he's such a good man. Khabib, man. Everybody, everybody has condolences for Khabib and his father because they're, they're, they're such great people. And, yes. it, you know, we're looking at people, Francis Naganu, who is supposedly a wonderful person. I mean, so, people. Yeah, wonderful guy. Sweetheart people, of a guy. Sweetheart. Right. <laughs> killer, so, so looking, but sweetheart. <laughs> a killer, but sweet, the hardest hitter, you know, on record, but, but a sweetheart. Yes. But, but we can see that with people. A lot of non-fighters, they – they don't, they don't have anyone pushing them, yes. but they have to learn the same lessons. And yes. so I think your message is applicable to everyone in the world, uh, Coach, and I think that message definitely resonates. Yes, and, 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 you know, I'm not saying when it's fight time or any big moment, you know, you have to do that 10-point that, that uh, presentation to the CEOs of the company. Of course, there's anxieties and stresses that our minds trick us into. What I always tell my guys, no stress, just express. When you feel that weirdness, that, that oh shit, just express. There's no pressure in expressing. I'm not saying go knock the hell out of him. You better win this. No, you ain't better win nothing. You ain't better do nothing. Just express yourself. And that expression is going to be beautiful. Because I already know in my mind, we trained hard. We ran the mountain. We did our shark drills. We sparred. You did proper technical training. Your expression is going to be beautiful. You know what I mean? And that, that's the thing the fighters aren't understanding. Um, let yourself go. You're going to do the right things because you prepared yourself properly. You've done it in the gym. You're going to do it that night at that performance. And doesn't guarantee you're going to win, but you're going to put up a performance. You're going to paint a picture so beautiful, no one will be able to disrespect you. Uh, you brought up Dustin Portier. Dustin Portier last week versus Dan Hooker. Portier Oof. won, but did anyone disrespect Dan Hooker? Does anyone uh, look at Dan Hooker in a lighter light or whatever, in a worse light? No. We all no respect way. Dan Hooker because he went out there. He went to war. It didn't go his way. Poitier was the better man, but it doesn't mean Dan Hooker's not a great man. It was just Poitier won. Man. Yeah, Poitier won the fight, but hey, they both expressed, you know, themselves beautifully, and one guy got his hand raised, but Dan Hooker's still a winner, and hey, and 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 he has nothing to hold his head down for. And, and that and that and that kind of comes to I think from when you're talking about you know you're you're doing you know the smokers at ten and you're the adults are standing you up and pushing you back into the ring. Um, and and, 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 walk away and, and remember, one. remember everybody who knows about those school smokers, it wasn't no matchups. You went there and you found out who you're fighting. Then it wasn't <laughs> like you had time to prepare. Sometimes you fought the same guy three, four, five times. Right? Like, there's no fight after that. Like, the problem was settled. You, you know, you took it out, and it's not like one of you looked down on one of the other ones and you're fighting the kids yeah. or whatever. So that was – Yeah, yeah. yeah you hug and keep it moving. That. You hug right. and keep it right. moving. But, but, but that's what I mean about no stress, just express. Do what you meant to do, and, and the world's going to, you know, judge it the way they want to. But us real fighters, us real warriors know – we know if a guy put it on the line. We know if he did his best. We know if he really um, uh, exhibited the better version of, of himself or if he let the elements that we talked about, those unnecessary elements, come in and affect him adversely. And these are the things that people really have to work on, man. Uh, not letting those negative elements 
crowd noise, hype of the fight, um, what people are saying on Twitter, all these things, being the underdog or the huge favorite, not letting these exterior elements that really has nothing to do with the fight or the matchup uh, invade on you. And, and these are things that that it takes experience to gain, and uh, a lot of guys need to learn it because I see a lot of guys fold under pressure, and the pressure is all self-induced psychologically. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Powerful stuff. Coach, I got I got one more question for you, and then uh, we wrap it up. So we, we've heard a lot from you tonight. We've heard experiences. We've heard – you know, wisdom gained from those experience. We've heard, uh, you know, advice. We, we've heard a lot. And so when you look back, you know, thinking through the Hall of Fame, thinking through the first pro fight, thinking through the, you know, the first smokers, any particular point in your in your career um, through all of it that, you know, kind of stands out as, I guess, like a shiny moment or, you know, any any particular memory that or, or accomplishment that means more to you than the rest of them. Why, like, what is, I guess, your proudest moment um, in your career as a, as a martial artist? God, I've had so many proud moments and so many great moments. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I would have to say my proudest moment was my first K1 tournament ever. Um, uh, the first time I actually fought, I was selected to fight in the eight man tournament. Mm. Um, I think I think that was my proudest moment because I was a 25 to one underdog. I was fighting the super heavyweight champion from the AKA gym, Javier Ooh. Mendez's gym, may I add, John Claude mm. Layer. Oh, John Claude oh. Layer was a leg kicking phenom. He broke guys' legs in fights and fights and all of this, and he came in at like two almost 240 pounds. I came in at like. 197 pounds. Oh, everyone, oh. everyone said, you know, one round, my leg will be broken and the fight will be over. He's a four-time world champion, and I beat him that night, and I put him in retirement that night. And I'll never forget that because my mom and dad both have passed away now. Mm. But I'll never forget that they were sitting ringside with my Black Cobra gear on, um, sweatsuit, um, my dad was a Marine, by the way. So I'm the Black Cobra, but the sweatsuit I had on was white, red, and yellow. You know, red and yellow is the Marine Corps colors. Right. So I had I had a, a Black Cobra outfit made, specially made in Thailand, shipped to me with the Marine Corps colors because I knew my dad would be proud. It was one of the first fights of mine that he, he went to um, with my mom. I'll never forget that fight. John Clark kicked me in my kneecaps the entire fight. Cecil Peoples, the master Cecil Peoples was the referee. And I just remember he was kicking hard too, guys. Those <laughs> leg kicks. I felt every one of them, man. He Kill was me. killing my legs. But you guys got to see that fight. Dewey Cooper versus I've John Clark Lair. And I went to fight. war with him. I beat him. I ended up dropping him in the third round. I, yeah. I won a unanimous decision in that fight. I shocked the world. I was a 25 to 1 yeah. underdog in that fight. So you, I'll you never forget. Homeless and hungry. I'll, I'll never forget Javier Mendez calling me early in the morning of my fight, asking me for tickets. If I sold tickets, turn them into the K1. Javier was John Claude's trainer, called me to wake up at like five in the morning. Javier probably forgot about that. I love you, Javier, but you tripped out. Waking me up the morning of my fight. And uh, I just remember beating John Claude Lair. And after the fight, here's why it's my most special moment. After the fight, man, I could barely walk. He chopped my kneecaps up. Now I remember walking after they raised my hand. Michael Buffer announces my name. I go toward my corner. Nick grabs me, hugs me. And my mom runs up to the ring, my beautiful mom. And she climbed up the ropes and she walked me down the ring and then my dad gave me a big hug man my dad was a real man he didn't hug you and say he loved you very much but he told me son i love you and i'll never forget that day man it was one of the best days of my life bring tears in my eyes thinking about it right now he hugged me and told me he loved me it was a great moment for me 
Man, it's a beautiful coach. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for coming. Um, why don't you tell the people real quick how they can find you, um, your your social media, Instagram, Facebook, um, anything you'd like to, to let them know they can they can look you up, you, your fighters, how how should they find the Black Cobra? Um, yeah, you can find me on Instagram that I use that the most. I'm not a big Twitter guy and all of that. Uh Facebook is played out. <laughs> so Instagram um is DC Black Cobra. Please follow me. DC Black Cobra. I spell Cobra with a K.